Hello, and on behalf of everyone at Otsuka, we hope you're staying safe and healthy. My name is Eli Perez, and I'm Director of Patient Advocacy and Stakeholder Management at Otsuka America Pharmaceutical. It is my pleasure to be here to talk about mental health, mental resiliency, and the challenges that we are all facing in the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm joined today by three experts who are going to share their perspectives on what each of us can do if and when we need mental health support. It's neither a secret nor surprise that these shelter-in-place orders have made it more difficult to get support, while at the same time creating a greater need for it due to isolation and stress. But there are resources available if you know where to find them. Our goal today is to talk through what options are available, what steps can be taken, and what each of us can do to support our own mental wellness. Our conversation today will cover three main questions. First, we'll ask, how has the COVID-19 pandemic complicated or restricted access to care and resources? And how is that shaping how people are experiencing mental health challenges? Second, we'll address the question, how can people seek care and resources in this new environment? And third, we'll ask, what new opportunities exist for mental wellness and resiliency? If the pandemic will give us the opportunity to create a new normal, what should that new normal look like to better foster mental wellness? As you may know, today's discussion is only one part of a series of videos. Please have a look at the other episodes on mental health and stay tuned for more to come. Now, let me introduce today's guests. Darcy Gruchadaro, the Director for the Center for Workplace Mental Health at the American Psychiatric Association Foundation. Marjorie Morrison, the CEO and co-founder of PsychHub. And Dr. Jeremy Nobel, a board-certified physician in both internal and preventative medicine, founder of the Foundation for Art and Healing and the Unlonely Project, and on the faculty at Harvard Medical School in the Center for Primary Care. Welcome, everyone. So I want to start things off with Darcy. Darcy. The work that you do at the American Psychiatric Association Foundation focuses on workplace mental health. At a time when very few of us are physically going to work, how might that impact access to care and resources for people who are accustomed to that supporting guidance in the workplace? Yeah, so thank you so much and thank you for inviting us to participate. I, I guess I would start by saying access to care has always been complicated. So it was complicated before COVID-19 and this pandemic, and it is likely to get even more complicated because we are likely to see a surge in the number of people that need mental health care and services and supports. But there are certainly things that employers and employees can do to really address this issue of access. I would say to begin with, it's really important for employers to remind employees about the employee assistance program and how to access it. So that is typically something available in the majority of employers. And it is a really key place for people to start if they are interested in or they feel like they need a referral. And even if they're experiencing high levels of stress and which of course most of us are, it's a very important place for them to start. The other thing I would say on the positive side is telebehavioral health was stood up in this country in a matter of a couple of months. So it's a, it's a delivery model that makes it easier for people to access care through video connection and through phone lines. So the good news is uh, health plans, employers, providers all really went to work quickly and the federal government supported some um, relaxing of regulations to make it easier for care to be delivered through this modality. So it should be easier for people to access care if they were already getting mental health care, which is of course very important for people who may be experiencing stepped up issues, but it's also important for those experiencing mental health issues for the first time. In terms of resources, it's very important for employers to be making mental health highly visible during this time and really sharing information with their employees about how mental health is being significantly impacted, what things they can do to help prevent the onset of mental health conditions and protecting their mental health. And also letting people know if you're experiencing high levels of stress, anxiety, depression, if you're really worried about your mental health, get help early because early 
getting connected with care early leads to the best results. So it's important for employers too, to think about ways to connect people because we know connection is extremely important for those that may be feeling isolated and alone. And that is true for many who may live alone and, and, and really use the workplace as a place to go and connect with others as part of their social connectedness, which is part of staying mentally and physically healthy. So, so access is a challenge, no question about it. EAP and primary care are good places to start if you're looking for ways to access care. Talk with your HR and benefits leads about connecting through your health plan if you're having challenges and let them know if you're not able to connect with care because they can use their purchasing power and leverage that to work with the health plan to help improve access to care. But the only other thing I would say is this is an important time for employers to be looking at their data. They should expect to see an uptick in EAP data numbers and, and people accessing services and supports, they should also be looking at their health plan data. If they're not seeing an uptick, that's a big warning sign that they need to work with their EAP and their health plan to find more innovative ways to reach employees with information about the availability of these avenues to access care. Thank you very much for that, Darcy. Um, and you teed me up perfectly for my next question, which is for Dr. Nobel, because uh, Darcy, you hit upon the idea of connection and loneliness. And so uh, Dr. Nobel, the Unlonely Project embraces the belief that there are deep connections between loneliness and health. Uh, so in a time when we're stuck at home, uh, how do these connections change? I mean, as we're intentionally staying apart in social distancing, what are you seeing? What are you hearing? What does this mean in terms of loneliness? Yeah, thanks, Eli, and, and thanks for the opportunity to share some of our work uh, with the audience. So as you pointed out, there's growing awareness that loneliness is really a problem for mental health, also for physical health. And in times like COVID-19, when you have enforced physical isolation, we have to be vigilant to make sure that the physical isolation doesn't lead to social isolation. And that's an important distinction. We need to be physically apart from each other so we don't have viral transmission and spread. But that doesn't mean we need to have a sense of social disconnection from family and friends. It does mean we have to think about doing it in different ways. And that's really become a major focus of many activities, really trying to uh, prevent physical isolation from leading to social isolation, loneliness, and the distress it causes. So it is well known that loneliness is probably the biggest preventable risk factor for the classic triad of mental illness challenges, depression, substance abuse, and suicide. And then the question is, what can we do about it during times like these? As Darcy mentioned, there are many ways we can foster connection. We can encourage people to uh, connect virtually in a variety of ways, to have meaningful conversations and exchanges with family, friends, coworkers, and so on. But most importantly, to be aware of loneliness. And if you feel that that loneliness you're experiencing is too deep, too extended, too severe, getting in the way of feeling like you're your best self, connecting in the way you would like to with your life, it is important to ask for help. Deep and pervasive loneliness can be as hazardous for your health as any of the more classic mental illness challenges. And not only will it increase risk for the mental illness challenges, but if you do have a mental illness burden, whether it's depression or substance abuse, it's likely that you also become lonely because of that circumstance. And so if we're not careful, we end up into a bit of a cycle where loneliness can cause, say, depression. Depression then reduces your engagement with other people, increases risk for loneliness, and physiologic and behavioral risk factors then increase. And so now more than ever, we have to be vigilant. The good news is there are things we can do, and I'm sure on this webinar, we'll be exploring them further. Absolutely, thank you very much for that, Dr. Nobel. I wanna to turn to Marjorie. Um, so Marjorie, PsychHub takes a wide view of mental health, and your organization works to create resources for a vast diversity of audiences, including not only individuals seeking mental health solutions, but also healthcare providers, hospitals, employers, schools, and more. 
as you think about the very different situations each of these populations is going through, what overall observations would you offer up about their responses to the pandemic? Are there, are there any broad trends uh, that apply across groups, particularly as we think about accessing care and resources? First of all, thank you so much for having me. And um, it's great to be on with, with Jeremy and, and Darcy and hear from them because I think they touched on it too. You know, mental health was already having problems before COVID. And when I say that is that, you know, all of understanding behavioral health is really complicated. And I, I as a therapist myself, I'm always surprised at how, how complicated it is to the average user. I mean, there's so many different types in our profession and you have psychiatrists and psychologists and social workers and licensed counselors. And so there's so many problems just on the types of providers. Then you go into the difference between symptoms and diagnoses and that's kind of rather subjective. Then you can go into other issues on treatments. And most people don't know that there's evidence-based treatments that are proven to be more successful at treating problems so or symptoms. So you take all of that and then you throw COVID in it. And now you have an increase all types of symptoms people are experiencing, as Jeremy said, increased loneliness, isolation, concern about their financial well-being, concern about their future, um, panic attacks. And one of our most our videos that's having the most views right now. So you take all of these symptoms and they just get magnified under this situation. And then you add on your last piece of their question about access. And then on top of that, there really aren't enough providers to meet the demand. So I think that on one hand, we've got to educate. And that education looks different to all those audiences that you mentioned. Um, I think the work that Darcy's doing and APA is doing on educating the workplace is so important and helping them understand that they have resources with EAP not often utilized and they're great resources. So educating them, the schools and universities, that alone is a whole different set of resources, whether you're talking about K through 12 or talking about universities. So there's this huge piece that I think I'm grateful to be in at PsychHub on that knowledge perspective, because then, then you have consumers and educating consumers to be informed consumers about their mental health, knowing what types of mental health to look for. And it's not the same for everybody and everybody doesn't need the same type of care. So I, I think that there's multiple layers to the problems and they're complex and they're not easy answers. I'm grateful in a certain sense out of COVID that more people are talking about it. And I think we're gonna come up with and know new types of interventions and new ways that educating people about their, their symptoms, what kind of help to use and how to best access that is going to be something positive that we can all take from this. And that's a great way uh, to end that question, Marjorie, that we can learn from this experience and hopefully we will continue to learn as we move forward. And I know PsychHub is gonna play a very important role in getting that education out.